Good morning and welcome to April 3rd. We are a week from Palm Sunday, two weeks from Easter. For those of you who are joining us by video this morning, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I titled our sermon this morning, The Ones That Didn't Get Away. I've been preaching a series on miracles, and we first looked at the miracle of which took place at the wedding at Cana. We learn there, John says, this was the first of his signs that Jesus did so that men, women, might believe in him. That was his purpose for it. Yes, he graciously took care of the needs of a bride who would have been embarrassed, a family who would have been ashamed that they had not properly gotten enough to provide for all their invited guests. He steps in and takes care of it. I mentioned some of the best advice you'll ever read is found when Mary turns and says to everyone around, this, my son, this person, Jesus, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Great advice, good life's advice. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Our second miracle, which was um, the miracle over uh, death, over the storms of life, and over a woman who's hemorrhaging. I think I put all three together in one message, and we understood Jesus cares. It's a woman who's hurting. She's separated. She's unclean because her ceremonial uncleanness. A leper is unclean. And then there's a synagogue's child who has died, and Jesus is going to come and raise that child from the dead. And so he shows his authority over nature, humanity, the spiritual realm, everything. Shows his ultimate authority. Okay? <clears throat> this morning. Miracles that help with life's focus. Luke chapter 5. Follow me. I have it on screen. If you've got your Bible open, verse 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or its Sea of Galilee, same body of water. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. We'll find out later who the fishermen are. As I read through this, I'm thinking to myself, these fishermen probably were not listening to Jesus at the time. They were busy working. And they missed what he had to say, but Jesus is going to make sure that he involves them. So this is what he does. He gets into one of the boats, which was Simon's. Now, please notice as we go through this, the name change that happens. It's his given name, which is Simon. And later on, Jesus is going to give him a new name. But that new name will be introduced to us a little later in the passage. At the moment, he's Simon. He got into Simon's boat and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And then he sat down, began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water, push out further, and let down your nets for a catch. And so Simon answered him and says this, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I'll do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and the nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so they began to sink, that is, the boats. And Simon Peter saw what had happened. He fell down at Jesus' feet. And here's his response. Please, depart from me. Go away. Jesus, I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. He's confronted with the Son of God, and that's his first response. It says amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus then said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. So Simon knew what it was like to catch fish. And now Jesus is doing what? He's changing the trajectory of Simon's life. That's what this miracle is about says, when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed him. Father, may you add your blessing to this word. May we understand more about 
the miracles of Jesus and the intention behind them, and see the change that takes place in Simon Peter and the fact that they left everything and followed you. May we do the same. Understand your miracles, their purpose, and then leave everything and follow you, we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen. By this time, the word about Jesus had been beginning to grow. We would call it exponentially. Crowds were gathering around, so many of them around him at this time, that if you imagine a throng of people so close, he didn't have the capacity to talk to all of them at one time. So what does he do? He walks over, he asks, can I use your boat? They push a short way out just to get far enough out so that he can talk to all the crowds. Everyone can hear him. See, he's very purposeful. He knows what he wants to do. He was a teacher and a preacher of such excellence. They said, never have we heard anyone teach at all like this man. Never have we seen miracles at all like this man. Who else has opened the eyes of the blind and raised the dead? Standing next to the Sea of Galilee, he sees fishermen. They've just finished working. They're cleaning their nets, getting ready to go home. Been a long night for them, a frustrating night. Jesus chooses Simon's boat. He chooses Simon's boat, particularly. He wants that man because this is the one that's not going to get away. He wants it to be a pulpit. And now that boat becomes a pulpit for Jesus. And so for a while, as he speaks to the crowd, it's a pulpit. Then he turns it back into a boat, fishing boat. But from that chosen spot, people can listen. After sermon, which Luke doesn't record here, but you'll find in other places, Jesus now prepares to set several men's lives on a different trajectory. My life before Jesus was headed in the wrong trajectory. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. I picked my own way. And it was just away from God. We often complain, oh, that way is really bad. That's worse. This, you know what? Every person walking away from God has just got the wrong direction. So we all need to turn around toward Christ, have our trajectory changed. And that's what Jesus did for me. Jesus not only changes their trajectory, their way of life, but he gives them a new purpose and a new focus. That, by the way, is his intention for everyone who watches the video, for all you in church. He wants to change the intention of your life, change the focus of your life, change the trajectory of your life, change the purpose of your life help you understand why he created everything. So Jesus then tells Simon, push out further. You need to get out in the deep water and then let your net down for a catch. I, I wonder with Peter's response, Master, we've been out all night long. We've caught nothing. <clears throat> I wonder if there's a little bit of a sigh in his voice. You know, kind of like, take a deep breath. You know, Master, we've, we've been working all night long. I'm tired hungry. We just cleaned our nets. And now you're telling us to go back out? But he catches himself. You know, this is not a weekend fisherman. This is a guy who does it for a living. Weekend fishermen come home and they'll tell you one of two things. They'll tell you about the big one that got away, you know, and I'll show you how how big the big one was that got away. It's like, I can't put my hand up, show you how big it was, but it's like, here on the video, you can't see it. It's the big one. Oh, you should have seen a big one got away, really. Yeah, I was ready to pull in the boat or ready to pull it up with a net, and I just couldn't, you know. Really, the big one. Or they use a phrase called, I got skunked. So if you're a fisherman, a weekend fisherman, you know what getting skunked is. Came away with nothing. They got skunked. Now, that's worse than the big one that got away. And it's worse than getting skunked for them because they make a living off of this. They've got nothing to take to market. They've made no money. 
He said, we've toiled all night. So they must have been frustrated also. So I can imagine this, you know, taking a deep breath for a moment and letting Jesus know as if he didn't already. You know, often surprising we think God doesn't know what we've gone through when he does. Jesus knew exactly what their night was like, but he's got a surprise in store for them. So that's why he says, go out. You know, I want to tell you, when Jesus tells you to go do something, he has something wonderful in store for you. So Simon decides, okay, we'll go do it. And that willingness to say yes to Jesus changes his life. So they push out in the deep. He begins to fish. He's fishing in the middle of the day now. That's not the best time. At nighttime, the fish can't see the net too dark. But during the day, they can see you, right? Yeah. They can see this net. It's the last thing they want to be around. But Peter finds out that the result is a huge catch of fish, so large that he's got to call another boat to come by and help with the catch. There is enough fish to fill both of these boats to the brim. Both of these boats overloaded. Well, they'll start taking on water. They've got so much here. As soon as Simon sees the miracle, he reacts. And interesting, now the writer Luke changes his name from Simon to Simon Peter. It's now Simon Peter that reacts. So it's the name not just of the fisherman, but now the name of the fisher of men, the apostle. The change is taking place. The change begins this way. As the miracle begins to take effect, Simon Peter's first response is honesty and humility. And folks, that's where we all have to start with God. Honesty, humility. What's his honesty? I'm a sinner. What's his humility? I'm not worthy of you or this. That's the first step that all of us need to take. Honesty, humility with the Lord. He says, depart from me. That's the last thing that we need. We need Jesus. I need Jesus to stay with me. We need the Spirit of God to stay with us. But Simon suddenly is overcome with the person standing in front of him. And his response is honest. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve to be near you. I don't deserve to have happen what you just did for us. Simon's faced with that truth. God is holy. We are unholy. God is pure. We are impure. God is righteous. We are unrighteous. God is sinless. We're sinful. God is faithful. We're unfaithful. You can name all the adjectives that you want. God is par excellence. All of them to the nth, most greatest good degree ever. Human beings, we're a mixture, some of the worst, and then some of the not so worst, but every one of us, every one of us got to say, I'm a sinner. It's where it starts. But the reason Jesus Christ came to this earth was exactly what he did on that day. He came to Peter. The reason Jesus Christ came to this earth is what he did in my life some decades ago. He came to Greg. And the reason why Jesus Christ came to this earth is because he came to you. Amen. It was his purpose. We need him. The second thing that we notice is that this catch of fish is far larger than the fishermen and their boats could ever handle. What does that say? That the ability of God to supply is immensely greater than our ability to contain his blessings. Immensely greater. Story in the Old Testament, the prophet says to a woman, go grab as many jars as you can. 
and the little bit of oil that you got left, start pouring them into the jars. And she did. And she poured it in one jar, and she poured it in another jar, and she poured it in another jar, and another one, another one. And she filled up all the jars she had. And she lacked nothing then for the rest of that drought and famine. When the people came to listen to him speak, they were hungry. And Jesus turned to his disciples after they fussed about this. Send them away. And he said, no, you give them something to eat. It's us. They don't have enough money. Take a year's wages for us. Where are we going to get food to feed all these people? And he asked a question. What do you have? And they said, well, there's one little guy here and he's got his lunch. Some fish and bread. And he said, bring that to me. And they did. And then he said, have the people sit down. And they did. And then he looked up toward heaven, he gave thanks, he blessed it, he began breaking that food and handed it out. And you know what? It fed thousands of people. And there were leftovers. He said, see what's left? Get some baskets, pick it up, because I've given you more than enough for today. The ability of God to pour into your life is greater than what you can contain. Amen. You have to believe in the greatness of God. You need a miracle today? He has the capacity to give that to you and beyond. It's amazing what God can do. I imagine if they had tripled, quadrupled the number of boats, they still would not have enough room. Didn't matter. Bring a flotilla. It would have filled them all. God is able to supply all our needs, Paul says. Richly. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. You have to believe that about God. He's capable. This pandemic, as horrific as it has been, was not a shock and a surprise to God. Nothing that goes on in the world is a surprise. It's not like God said, oh, well, I didn't know about that. Thank you for telling me. Do you have some advice on how I should handle it? No, nope. God doesn't need any of that. God can handle Every problem you got, you just need to bring it to the Lord. You have just a little bit, just give your little bit to God. Doesn't matter. He can take a little bit and make a lot. He, now unto him who can do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be glory by Christ Jesus and through the church forever. So God's not limited, we are. Jesus shows his power over the fish of the sea. They do his bidding. There was no swarm of fish out all night, no school. Now there was. Why? Because Jesus commanded it, and it was. The fish swarmed together at the nets at the command of Jesus. We are different creatures, however. God wants us to say yes. He's given us something called free will. doesn't violate that, so you have to say yes to Jesus. Not everyone will obey and follow Jesus. The Gospels tell us that by and large, not all, but by and large, the religious leaders from the high priest on down, the elites, opposed him. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes opposed him. Not all. Some got saved. It's a shame. Standing in front of them was the greatest miracle that God entered into the world, and they rejected. Simon does the right thing. He said, Master, we worked all night, but at your command, we'll go back out. That's what God wants to hear. So, yes, I get tired. My body hurts. Things I don't feel like doing. But when Jesus says, go do it, you know what? You get up and you go do it. And then you trust that when you do what God wants you to do, he's got a blessing on the other side for you. No one will ever stand in a position of being owed by God. Nobody. So the last thing we learn is that this miracle actually accomplishes its purpose. It was designed not to catch a lot of fish. It did that. It was designed... 
to change hearts, to change minds, to change the course of a human's life, a man's life. Three men, Simon, Peter, James, and John. Now, we're different because this miracle took place. You see, the children of Israel saw the plagues in Egypt. They watched as God made a difference between them and the Egyptians. Constantly, Moses would go and make a demand. The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, says, let my people go. And the first question coming from Pharaoh is real simple. Who is this God? I don't know him. And secondly, he says, it seems like you folks have too much time on your hands, don't you? So, go tell them, we're going to expect you to gather all the straw and mud and everything all by yourselves and keep the same amount of work going. And you know what the children of Israel do? They come to Moses and they complain. And you know what Moses does? He goes to God and he says this, you haven't done at all what you said you'd do. That's what he says. And you know what God's answer is? You haven't seen anything yet. I'm getting ready. Go back in now and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And this time when he doesn't, he will find out what it is to oppose the God of all creation. And God begins one by one judging the gods of Egypt until the very last one. Last week we had a wonderful presentation of Christ in the Passover. We understood that during Passover, they were to take the life, slay the lamb, and then take the blood, catch some of it in a basin, and sprinkle it around the doorposts. And they were to stay in the house until the angel passed over, saw the blood, and then the call came. Time to leave. Stay packed, folks. Stay ready. Listen for the call. It's coming. Stay in the house. The only place of salvation is the house of God, the church of God. Stay in it. Get the blood around you. You'll be okay. They saw the miracle of manna every day. Eventually they reached a point and they said, we're tired of this food. We don't like it. We remember what it was like to live in Egypt and be able to eat onions and leeks and fish and all the good stuff. We like that better. Really? You like being a slave in Egypt? Better than being free? And besides that, you're not going to stay in the wilderness forever. You're just journeying through it. Oh, no, but we're tired of this man. God sent them quail. And God judged them, too. God gave them water out of a rock. And yet they complained. Why? They did not mix faith with the miracle they had seen. Simon Peter mixes faith with the miracle. He sees the miracle. He suddenly understands who it is standing in front of him. He acknowledges, I'm not a worthy man of this at all. Jesus said, I want you to be a fisher of men, Simon. Come follow me. And so he does. He mixes the miracle with faith in his heart. Folks, that's what God intends. Some people seek miracles just to see God do some wonder things. It's not the purpose. Don't be a miracle chaser, be a Jesus chaser. Simon became a brand new man, no longer fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, there'd be a time a little later on he'd go fishing again. Why? Because he had failed. He denied Jesus and he had thought, you know what, it's over. I'm, I'm done. I just said to this young servant girl three times, she said, I, you gotta be one of them. Oh, no, no, not me. I was sure I saw you in the crowd with him the other day. Oh, no, no, not, not me. You're a Galilean. I'm sure you, I, I called down curses. I don't know the man. So he figured, it's, um, Jesus is done with me. He's got to be. But he wasn't. Jesus went fishing. He caught the men he wanted. Now, Peter would fish, but he would fish in the temple on the day of Pentecost. How? Preach this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. He is now Lord and Messiah. Messiah is the word he would have used. He's the Messiah. He's the one 
by whom God will judge the hearts of all mankind. And they were cut in the hearts and they said, what do we need to do? And Peter said, you need to do what I did. You need to repent. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thousands got saved. Simon Peter also needed to remember from that point on, Simon Peter, when you saw the miracle of Jesus, you need to remember, it's never your wisdom, your power. How'd you do when you went out fishing last night, Simon? I didn't do well at all. Simon Peter, how'd you do when you went fishing with Jesus? Well, I did pretty well. It wasn't his skills that brought the huge haul of fish, it was Jesus. In the same way, Peter needed to remember through the church work, as Paul would know. It's not our skill, it's not our intelligence, it's not our resources, it's not our preaching ability. It has nothing to do with building the church. It's the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ, pointing to people to Jesus. The presence of the Holy Spirit filling people's hearts and changing lives. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. I will. I wonder, how could he use me? I wonder. Every preacher's got to wonder that sometime. If they don't ever ask themselves that question, then they're too full of themselves. Just the honest truth. Who's sufficient, Paul says. It's God who makes us adequate. God makes us adequate. I have to trust. He will. So that power and ability to draw hearts belongs to Jesus. It's the Spirit of God in the day of Pentecost that drew people to Jesus. All Peter had to do, get out there and preach about me. Preach about Jesus. Tell him about the cross. Tell him about his death for, my, his death for our sins. Tell him about his resurrection from the dead. Tell him he's coming back again to redeem his people, and judge the world. Tell them, tell them, tell them, Peter. So Paul says, I'll glory one thing only. I will glory, not in my wisdom, I'll glory in the cross of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. So Peter, later on, he writes this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body. Who is that? That's Jesus. What did he do? He bore our sins. He carried them. Where? In his body. He took a human body, human nature, and died on the cross. For what? For my sins. For your sins. For the sins of the whole world. So that, here's the corresponding, we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That's our call. For by his wounds you were healed. Peter puts together the... The, I preached from Matthew 8. It says, Jesus fulfilled what Isaiah had said, our griefs he carried, our sorrows, when he healed people. Well, here's the other reason. His wounds also paid for our sins, both. So our sins and the results, which is sickness and death, Jesus paid the price for all of it on the cross. So now he says, you were continually straying like sheep. Yes, Peter, I was. I was straying like sheep, lost, thinking I got it all figured out, and I didn't. But you've returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Please listen to me. Jesus is the guardian and the shepherd of your soul. You can trust your soul to him only. Peter's preaching from that point on was always about the centrality of the cross of Jesus Christ. From the day of Pentecost till the moment Peter preached his final sermon, whenever and wherever that took place, he never forgot who was the one who changed his life, gave him a new calling, a new purpose, new focus. And the miracle that was done on that day changed the trajectory of his life. What has God done for you? Has it changed the trajectory of your life? Give you new purpose and brought you to the one true, good, only shepherd of our souls, Jesus Christ. To him alone 
be glory and honor and power and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We praise you. Jesus, we ask for a miracle in our lives. We ask for a miracle that will change the direction of our life, that will renew the purpose of our life, that will help us see the value that you have placed upon us and the truth that you've united us with yourself so that forever you might offer us to the Father, the body of Jesus Christ, submitted unto him, that God the Father might be all and in all. God, it is amazing when I think of what you're going to accomplish. It's beyond my capacity to fully imagine, but I trust you. And just like Simon Peter, Lord, I leave the past behind, and I come now and follow you, Jesus. Watching by video, make the commitment to turn from your sins, turn to Jesus, and follow him all the days of your life. God bless you.